that I can send you a date with Joe. This is Rommel's ring ceremony. And today is... What is today? September 9th, 
Robert D. Johnson. Robert M. Johnson. David E. Kaufman. James M. K. Sean T. Kelly. Michael S. Kennedy. Michael R. Kilgore. Daniel E. Kirkland. Jason D. Klotz. Michael J. Klump. Mark E. Kassel. Matthew R. Kunz. Henry M. LaFrance III. Robert E. Lazarus. Arthur J. Levine V. Philip C. LaBelle. Darren J. O'Hall. Elliot S. Bonoli Jr. Michael P. Leone. Billy C. Lewis. J.L. Sharden. David E. Linson. Jeffrey W. LaCow. John M. Lipson. Jimmy W. Lopes, Jr. Anthony S. Bartano, Jr. Sean F. Guarca. Lyle J. Quack. Craig M. Morris. Sonny M. Mike. David M. Mueller. This is better night. Joshua David Y. Mullen. Pete Ogden, Justin and Ola, Gerardo Marti, Tomji Pendano, Troy L. Peterson, Jean Paul Pierre, Jason H. Rusa. Jacob R. Rusa. Scott M. Sanchez. Adam D. Sauer. Aaron J. Savoy. Keith A. Scalco. John B. Chamber. <laughs> James T. Shiro. Jared M. Schmidt. Scott M. Schoolmine. Guy R. Schreiber. Daniel C. Schreiner, Jr. Christopher J. Schultz. 
Brian J. Sayers. Nicholas K. Schultz. Robert J. Signorelli. Paul S. Smith. Eric W. Sissai. Todd C. St. Martin. Our seniors, you will see here as our saints this morning. Also from Mrs. Robart and the student council members and the officers of the senior class, members of my administration, Mr. Serio, the program, and all of you other people, and particularly mom and dad, grandma, grandpa, aunts and uncles, to be part of your son's last days as they go to an end of Archbishop Rome. And then to continue to be a part when they become our alums. You've heard from Mr. Ferry and Father Lowe about the press, etc. And I just want to say that tonight, after the ring dance, before you go to bed, you're going to take the ring off and put it on your nightstand maybe, or maybe you're going to wear it, but what's going to happen if you wake up, it's going to be your hands going to be swollen, and you may not be able to get it off. So I suggest you take it off. And the only point I say is that when you take it off, you're still the same young man that you were when you had it on. For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, April 23rd, it's about quarter of two right now, and we snuck Scott's new car over here and put his car down the street, and we're waiting on him to get out of class now. He gets out of class 149, so we're gonna try and get his reaction. Okay. That looks good. <laughs> Michael. What's going on here? Nothing. Channel 6 News. Channel 6 News. Is it really a Channel 6 News? Yep. Where'd it go? Why don't they get out the way? Michael! Michael! Mike! Y'all come over here! Is he coming? Just, just kind of get to the side.
Shit, if they take this call, we're out of luck. Do y'all see him? Oh, yeah, I see him. Kind of a whisper, he would ask the same question. Is it the fourth? And he was told, no, Mr. Jefferson, it is not the fourth. And then finally, when the question was asked in a whispery voice, uh, the answer was affirmative. Yes, Mr. Jefferson, it is the fourth. In Quincy, Massachusetts, at five in the afternoon on the 4th of July, John Adams finally died. His last words were, Thomas Jefferson still lives. But Adams was wrong. Jefferson had died a few hours earlier in his alcove bed in his downstairs room at the heart of the great house he had never managed quite to finish. American history is replete with miraculous moments that convince you that there's something really quite special about the American project. And one of them is the simultaneous death. 50 years to the day after the signing of the Declaration of Independence of John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. These great rivals, the crusty, awkward, not very lovable, frankly, New England Federalist, and the graceful Virginia gentleman striking up this wonderful correspondence that becomes one of the treasures of American letters. Dying simultaneously, July 4th, 1826, and John Adams' last words were, Jefferson still survives. Indeed he does. remains in the end a mystery and many a historian who's pursued him has discovered that the pursuit of the historical Jefferson is much like the pursuit of the historical Jesus. There's a simple but extraordinarily resonant message that Jefferson somehow symbolizes, namely the future is going to be better than the past. I think the thing to remember from Jefferson is the power of the word, that ideas matter, that words beautifully shaped reshape lives, that a person who has certain disadvantages and flaws and even crimes, like holding slaves, uh, can transcend his imprisonment within reality by casting out words that take you into a new reality. Jefferson is the enigma of American history. He's indispensable. It's often said that Washington was the indispensable man, but it's Jefferson who's indispensable because he is mysterious, idealistic, pragmatic, misunderstood, complicated, paradoxical, hypocritical. He's the stuff of America, and that's, that's who we are, and that's why Jefferson has to be the center of our national discourse. The legacy of Thomas Jefferson is both a gift and a curse. He's a blessing in one way, for he gives us 
many important things that we can hold up as ideals. But uh, he cursed us with a practice of inequality and of slavery and the denial of justice that can scarcely be erased by anything we could think of. After his death, Jefferson's family was forced to leave the property. His slaves were sold and sent to other plantations. His furniture and French wines, his scientific instruments and his beloved books auctioned to the highest bidder. Monticello itself was neglected for a time, then bought by a Jewish family who struggled to preserve it in gratitude for Jefferson's bill establishing religious freedom. In the years to come, his country lurched inevitably towards civil war, each side claiming the master of Monticello as its mentor. His words would arm the pro-slavery arguments of secessionists and give comfort to the armies of Jefferson Davis. But his words would also inspire Abraham Lincoln, a generation of abolitionists and thousands of runaway slaves. We should remember Thomas Jefferson as a man who loved his country deeply, who believed in the inherent wisdom of the people and the educability of ordinary citizens. But I don't think he was convinced that America would be able to advance without fits and seizures and numerous torments. He didn't know how to hold the Union together. But in the end, I'm sure he felt that he had done his best, that he had lived up to his own dreams, that the decency which he felt in his dealings with other human beings would be a legacy that Americans could hold. I don't know if Thomas Jefferson is a figure that's easy to hold to one's heart, as it were, in the way some people have managed to hold Franklin Roosevelt or Abraham Lincoln. But I think that you can, with all his faults and contradictions, that you can hold him very close to your mind. And if there is such a thing as an American spirit, then uh, he is it. Jefferson essentially tells us that we cannot be complacent until two conditions are met. Every human being born on this continent has a right to equal, indeed identical treatment in the machine of the law, irrespective of race, gender, creed, or class of origin. And secondly, everyone born on this continent has a right to roughly equal opportunity at modest prosperity. And until those conditions are met, we cannot rest. When those conditions are met, we may say, as Jefferson said he would, nunc dimittis, now you may dismiss me. My work is done. I will not believe our labors are lost. I shall not die without a hope that light and liberty are on steady advance. And even should the cloud of barbarism and despotism again obscure the science and liberties of Europe, this country remains to preserve and restore light and liberty to them. In short, the flames kindled on the 4th of July, 1776, have spread over too much of the globe to be extinguished by the feeble engines of despotism. Thomas Jefferson.
Up next, Canal Street, The Great Wide Way, a WIS-TV Channel 12 documentary that looks at the life and times of New Orleans' Main Street. All for you on WIES-TV Channel 12. Television with a vision of what television can be. Corporate funding for this program was provided by General Motors. Whether it's building cars and trucks or supporting public television programs like this one, General Motors is in the business of helping people go where they want to go. Major funding was also provided by the Pew Charitable Trusts. The Arthur Vining Davis Foundations. The Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by annual financial support from viewers like you. Additional support was provided by Virginia Tourism and its driving tour of Jefferson's, Virginia. To order a video cassette of Thomas Jefferson, call PBS Home Video at 1 800 828 4 PBS. This is PBS. If you enjoyed this portrait of Thomas Jefferson, be sure to look for the next film from director Ken Burns, The Remarkable Journey of Lewis and Clark. This hour's broadcast is made possible in part by contributions of the members of WYS. Enter the world of National Geographic. Hawaii, uninhabited for millions of years, this primordial paradise lost its innocence when humans first sailed ashore. Today, plants and animals found nowhere else on Earth are under siege. Can we save our island paradise, or is it too late? Find out on the world of National Geographic. See it Saturday at 2 p.m. on Channel 12. Coming on the American experience. It was the worst winter ever recorded. They were hopelessly lost. A tragic tale of desperate survival, madness, and cannibalism. The legendary journey of the Donner Party. On the American experience. See it Monday at 8 p.m. on Channel 12. I want the challenge. I really want the challenge. If there's not a mountain in front of me anymore, I'm not happy. And some of the kids come in and said, are you on TV, Mr. Chavetti? And I said, no. He said, well, Miss Bird's got a movie with a bunch of guys racing in wheelchairs. And I thought, OK. So I went down there and basically stuck my head in the door and said, is this the video I've been hearing about all morning? Cool. This is cool. What exactly are you watching, Miss Bird? I'm watching Scientific American Frontiers, and this is a special segment that they've done on wheelchair races. The kids uh, learned everything about the physics of the wheelchair, and I think they came away with an appreciation of uh, physically challenged people. They didn't see Don Chavetti as the you know, teacher in the wheelchair anymore. They saw Don Chavetti as the guy that races. The good thing about scuba diving is it's a freedom, it's an independence. It's something up until a few years ago I never thought I could do. It is so visual and it is so beautiful. I can just suspend myself in the water and get proper buoyancy 
and I can feel like I'm standing up and it's, it stretches my back out. It just feels so good. It feels really, really great. No matter what obstacles life throws in front of you, that with determination and hard work, you can usually overcome about anything. I recommend that my students watch PBS. It makes my job as a career counselor a lot easier because they see firsthand some of the things that they can achieve if, again, they're willing to work hard. Proud to be a part of the community we serve, we're WYS-TV Channel 12. Television with a vision of what television can be. Funding for this program has been provided in part by a Municipal Participation and Civic Affairs Grant from the City of New Orleans. The following is a presentation of WIS-TV, New Orleans. Funding for this program is made possible by your neighbors on Canal Street, Jacob Shane and Son and P.J. McMahon and Son's Funeral Homes, together for 126 years on the Great Wide Way. When I was a little girl, Canal Street was the center of the universe, to me anyway. And we dressed up, we wore our best clothes and gloves, and we went to shop to see Santa Claus. We went to the doctor, the dentist, to see Mardi Gras parades. And it was where we went for all important events. My grandmother had a double strand of pearls, and when she put those two strands of pearls around her neck, I knew it was an important event, and that was for going to Canal Street. If you live in New Orleans or have just visited, you've probably spent time on Canal Street. It's still considered New Orleans' main thoroughfare. Although just as most of America's main streets have been affected by the rise of suburban shopping malls, the changes have not always been kind. Let's look back. Canal Street often served as a barometer, measuring how events at home and beyond touched us. But what sets Canal Street apart from any other big city main street? When you came to Canal Street, suddenly you were escorted into this enormous room, you know. And that's what, that's what Canal Street is. It's like a big room. Particularly if you're coming from the, from the French Quarter side, you're coming from this very tightly enclosed space, which is the European French Quarter, and bang, out into this huge space. Which means, well, first of all, the space changes, obviously very dramatic, but also the sound in the space changes. Because sound is different. The sound of the traffic, the sound of the people walking. This big room is wide, almost twice as wide as New York's Broadway. It's one of the widest streets in the world. The length, almost four miles, with the first mile often referred to as downtown New Orleans. Where does Canal Street get its name? With shipping cargo in mind, the city's French founders had planned to build a canal to link the Mississippi River with Bayou St. John. After numerous attempts, those plans resulted in a trail of paper. Canal Street was named after a canal that would never be built. When a street grid of the city was laid out in the early 1700s, what eventually became Canal Street was outside the city's boundaries. While New Orleans was under French and then Spanish rule, the street was known as the Commons for public use, as long as such uses didn't interfere with the line of fire from the cannons of the forts protecting the city. By the early 1800s, facing the cannons were neighbors, not enemies, living in a brand new neighborhood called Faubourg St. Marie. After the Louisiana Purchase, New Orleans petitioned the United States government to permit yet another attempt at a canal, with a public highway to be built alongside. How wide that area would be, over 170 feet, was actually determined by an act of Congress. Once again, digging up the money to build that canal proved to be merely a pipe dream. 
After disputes were settled over who actually owned the land, houses began popping up along the thoroughfare. One of the few remaining examples of these early homes was built in 1844 by respected New Orleans architect James Gallier. He designed it for an army surgeon who had served in the War of 1812. Today, it's the home of the Boston Club, a men's organization. Through the center of Canal Street runs a strip of land, and while it would be accurate to refer to it as a median, in New Orleans, it has another name and significance beyond that of a dividing line. It's an interesting um, little known fact about Canal Street that, that a Supreme Court of Louisiana case actually referred to it as a neutral ground, a dividing line, a cultural, if not a political, dividing line for sure. That cultural dividing line was between the old world French Creole culture of the early settlers and that of the Anglo-American newcomers from other parts of the United States. But they all came together to shop as more stores and less residences lined the thoroughfare. In 1849, Daniel Henry Holmes opened his dry goods store on Canal Street. He was enterprising enough to keep his store open late so that ladies could shop after an evening at the opera. The D.H. Home store prospered for over a century and a half. Meeting someone under the clock outside homes became a New Orleans tradition. I remember I, I would meet my friend Ken Kayfoot underneath <laughs> the Holmes clock. It's all, it's all coming back. I'd meet him underneath the Holmes clock, clock at 11 o'clock, no. at 11 o'clock, and we'd go in uh, and have uh, lunch at Holmes's. It was a ritual on the Saturday. And in those days, you had a big pile of, uh, you could get a big pile of shrimp ramelade for a dollar and a quarter. But I mean a huge plate. That was the large size, you know? And I remember that's what I'd have. We'd eat that, and then we'd mosey over to the uh, candy counter, the little pastry counter, and get a chocolate eclair, and then go down and see um, something at the Sanger at the low state of the Orpheum or something. For many families, shopping at homes was a ritual. We had our favorite salesperson, and Mama would demand that everything be taken home on approval. D.H. Holmes had a policy that anything could be taken back. And they took back things that they knew had been worn on Saturday night. Not by me, but by, by many customers. In 1989, the Canal Street store closed, and the chain of home stores changed hands and name. But for many of us, there was no place like Holmes. Yet, there were always several choices of stores on Canal Street. When we came downtown to buy a dress, we shopped at all the stores. We would go to Maison Blanche, Holmes, Gus Mayer, Gacho, um, and we would never, if we found a dress that we liked, we would put it on hold and go to the next store to make sure that we had left no stone unturned. And then finally, when we made a decision, we'd go back to that store and get the dress. On Canal Street, working as well as shopping can stir up memories. Earliest memories of Canal Street, automobiles parked on a 45 degree angle. Well, I go back to Canal Street, probably I started with Stevens Clothing Store back in 1931. My favorite customer was uh, Yuri Long. One day, this is when he was senator, and he came into Stevens Clothing Store and he had six bodyguards with him. He left two on the street two in the foyer and two came into the store and I'm standing up uh, in the front and I greeted him. I said, come on in, Senator. He called up one day and asked for me to send some pajamas over to him and I knew his size and it, well, we, at that time I had a, a Manhattan pajama, silk brocade pajama, eight fifty each and I told him, I said, I'll send you a box, pick out the one you want. Now there was a maroon, a green and a blue. He picked out the green. That's the one he received the German Navy in when they came here in New Orleans. Very much a part of the Canal Street scene since the turn of the century is Krauss Department Store, founded by two brothers named Krauss. Deserving much of the credit for its early success was a brother-in-law, Leon Hyman. It's still owned by the Hyman family. While today some people perceive this store as old-fashioned, what with its antiquated pneumatic tube system that handles charge account purchases, along with ancient cash registers, the store's manager feels it makes good business sense. 
I really don't want to part with that tradition. The cash registers are about as old as the grandparents that have been in here, but hey, what, you know, if somebody gives you cash and they buy $40 worth of stuff uh, or merchandise, you take the $40, you put it in the register and you ring up. Why do you have to have a $5,000 machine? Something else that makes Krauss unique, according to Kahn, is having the largest fabric department in an American department store. This department has its loyal customers. The fabric in the dress that I'm wearing is from Krauss, and I find that if Krauss doesn't have a certain type of fabric, it probably doesn't exist. For Kahn, his employees are also a source of pride. And when you go around the store and start talking to them and listen, you'll find them talking to the customer and say, here, dear, and here, babe. And they've never met the person before. And I used to go up and say, do you know those people? No, but that's the way we talk around here. A sense of longevity continues on Canal just a few blocks away. Men's haberdasheries have always been part of the scene on Canal Street. And a name that's been on the street since 1924 is Rubenstein. Adler's is another familiar name on the thoroughfare. Orleanians have been shopping for fine jewelry in this elegant setting for nearly a century. If shoes were on your shopping list, the Imperial Shoe Store was one of many establishments to choose from. The proper fit was essential, with a little help from the latest technology. Well. A lot of the stores had the x-ray machine. I think we had them at Mayor's Rules. It was, it was good because we, for a child, couldn't tell you how the shoe fit. You could see the outline of the whole foot. You could see if it was too big or too small. It, I thought they were great. When it was time to rest those feet, the soda fountain at a Canal Street drugstore could be an oasis. Places with soda fountains such as Cats and Best Off and Waterberries are no longer a part of Canal Street. But still around is Walgreens. Its soda fountain is also gone. But Walgreens' best known contribution to Canal Street is its sign. That sign is still very much a part of the street scene. On Canal Street, there have always been dime stores. One of them was Cress. Only the sign is left. Still with us are McCrory's, and two stores referred to in the New Orleans vernacular as Woolsworth. Well, you hear that term, Woolsworth, you hear that uh, like, like Holmes's. I mean, it's, it's a colloquialism, and I don't, I'm not able to localize it to a particular part of town, but it is a colloquialism, and Holmes's, Maisons, I mean, my aunts say Maisons, and uh, Maisons, Holmes's, uh, Cresses, I mean, I, you know, throw a S on, you know, just about everything. Whether you call it Maisons or Maison Blanche, this store has been on Canal since the early 1900s. Years later, shoppers couldn't help but notice a lively little character that appeared in the store during the Christmas season. For a town that rarely sees snow, seeing this little snowman is a sure sign that Santa is following close behind. The theme is a familiar one to baby boomers and their parents. Mr. Bingle, the frisky snowman that represents the Maison Blanche department stores, has been a fixture on Canal Street at Christmas since the late 40s. During the holiday season, in King Kong fashion, this snowman scales the Maison Blanche building. But a few of us still remember the puppet shows in the store window, and even on local television. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello, everybody. Hello. Puppeteer Oscar Eisentrout literally pulled Mr. Bingle's strings. He was a dear, and you know, he really was Mr. Bingle. I mean, his voice, he just had to do, I mean, I was Pete the Penguin, and I talk like this as Pete the Penguin. But Oscar, that was his voice. He, he, he may have gone up an octave, but not much. And the kids loved him. He was, a, he was very, very uh, charity-minded. He did all the hospitals, the schools, all free. 
Though it may seem like holiday heresy to locals, not everyone was a Bingle fan. I'll tell you quite frankly, Mr. Bingle never impressed me <laughs> in the least. <laughs> no, I'm afraid not. I much preferred the Santa Claus at Holmes's. Right. I, you know, you had a loyalty. You just didn't go to... The, the Santa Claus at, at Maison Blanche is overshadowed by Mr. Bingle, Thank who was a puppet. Being loyal you know, to Santa Claus. He could, <laughs> he could see right through that. <laughs> of course, you were impressed by the publicity that the guy got, but I, I much preferred Santa Claus at Holmes's. While downtown, looking at the decorated windows of the department stores was a must. Throughout the years, the street was decked out to deck the halls. One stop on a tour of downtown decorations meant veering off Canal Street just a few yards to what was then the Roosevelt Hotel. Lining the ceiling of the lobby was a snowy white substance called angel hair. If there is a symbol of Canal Street, perhaps it's the light posts. Erected on Canal during a beautification effort in 1930, the emblems of countries that have ruled the city can be found at the base of each post. Through the years, the light standards have been decorated to reflect special times, as has the street. To bolster citizen support during World War I, a parade was held to raise funds for Liberty Bonds. It included a Mardi Gras type float shaped like a tank. Among the celebrities attending, Charlie Chaplin, minus his mustache. Years later, when the country once